Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. Uh, we've done nearly 600 of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past <coughs> interviews menu, <clears throat> where you'll find all the older ones organized in several different ways. Um, this program is made possible th through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website, and there's also a page of other ways of supporting it if you don't feel like dealing with PayPal, which some people don't. <laughs> um, my guest today is Sheikh Fadlala Hairi. Um, Sheikh Hairi is a, or Sheikh Fadlala, is a Sufi mystic and visionary, um, an enlightened spiritual master. His life and work serve as a reminder that spirituality is a, a science and an art vitally relevant to our times. Sheikh Fadlala grew up in an environment where religious scholars, um, Sufi mystics, were part of his formative experience. His love and understanding of the universality of the Quranic message has imbued him with respect for other religions and spiritual paths. So welcome, Sheikh Fadlala. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as I was telling you earlier, I read portions of a number of your books. Um, you've written so many, and I found every one of them interesting. I, I wish I had had the time to read the more than thousands pages of books that, that you guys sent me, uh, but it, they're all you know well worth reading. And also, I listened to about six hours of your other interviews, and I have no doubt that we'll be able to you know we'll have a lively and wide ranging conversation today. And as I mentioned earlier, if people have questions during it, they can send them in. Um, so you've lived a fascinating life, and you're still living it. Um, You've been all over the world and done all sorts of things. And so I thought what we might do today is, you know, have our conversation be a mix of, um, you know, your own personal experiences and adventures. And you have all kinds of interesting stories of people you've met and things you've done. And the spiritual truths that, um, you know, you have gleaned from all those experiences and from your association with, you know, masters of various spiritual traditions and your own spiritual practice. Um, so how does that sound? It sounds very good. I, I would like to meet this <laughs> I think you've met him, <laughs> although he's more than a fellow. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's not very clear. You know, there's always a hazy view <laughs> to the whole story. Because go through the senses and monitor, and then the mind interprets and other events happened, but thank you. I was teaching a meditation course in Utah one time, and I came in late to the meeting, and I just got up on the stage, and I started talking, and, and somebody said, well, who are you? And I said, I don't know, I'm still working on that. That's it. <laughs> it's always worth in progress. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good attitude, you know? I mean, for instance, in the, in the uh, intro that I just read, which someone sent me, uh, you were described as an enlightened spiritual master. And maybe it's a good idea of, to um, explain what we mean by those terms. Fortunately, it, is, it wasn't me who had given all of these I didn't think so, no. But too, I, too modest. I know from my early days as a child, I was very curious to discover what is it. And I was fortunate also to take an interest in science and do a very basic, good, broad, if you like, spectrum type of a science uh, study. I was curious as to how things work, physical, chemical, biological, up, down the earth, the spheres turning, birth, death, time. So that curiosity had been always a, a drive for me to know essentially what turned out to be, as a summary, what is the origin and what is destiny and what is beyond space and time, and how does space and time emerge and submerge? So these were really key questions always with me. And as I, said, as I said, my studying a bit basic science was very helpful. And then working in the industrial world and as a petroleum engineer was very helpful also 
stealing what the earth had after millions of years managed to transform from tiny little uh, sea creatures into petroleum. And, and here we are suffering from the abuse that we have all committed. And so I was curious as to what is it, why is it, how is it, when is it, and always aware of the turning of the earth and the day and the night and on and on and on and the seasons and and always fascinated by the inner drive in each and every one of us to have that stability, reliability, security, knowing very well that I'm hanging on air. So that's a, not a very high secure state to be in. So these had been really the drives uh, that uh, propelled me with being very fortunate and always have had outer worldly activity. Otherwise, I wasn't in, in a monastic environment all my life. So I ended up realizing that ultimately I have to um, refurbish my own inner, inner monastery or inner Kaaba and always calibrate with it, knowing that um, the outer world will never be constant, will never be exactly the same. There are always strands of energies and inputs and outputs that bring about slight differences. And yet we are seeking for sameness, for constancy, and all of the other things that every human being wants. So soon I realized that really the answers have been given in different ways, in different cultures, different religions, and some of them are easier to understand and assimilate. Others are a bit more archaic and very culture specific. So I found that really we are all the same. The so-called children of Adam, the offsprings of this event in evolution of the Adamic being, the human being. Essentially, we are all looking for the same thing. Outwardly as animals, comfort, ease, uh, reliability, safety, and inwardly, we want to go beyond all of this. So nothing is enough. And that is where the confusion and difficulties arise. There's an aspect of me wants the earthly certainty, security, comfort. And another aspect of me can never be content with anything that is discernible or measurable. So I grew up very much aware of this dichotomy and that uh, soon I found that they are not in conflict. They actually complement each other. Uh, my earthly contentment, comfort, ease, recognition, social, political, personal, other, is never enough. So it was clear to me earlier on, I think in my early 30s, that I have to give more attention to the hidden cosmology, to the unseen part of me to the spirit in me, or any other name you give it. And I was also fortunate to never be too culture-specific without denying the culture. I always learned and enjoyed learning that one has to accept being local. You are born somewhere with a skin color, with an ambience, with a certain preference for foods and other things which were important in their locale. But so it is not to deny locality or being local, but more important to realize the universality of it all and also go past that. So it is supra universal. These were early on, by the time I think I was in my late 40s, it was very clear to me in order to live well, fully, enjoyably and be fulfilled, we have to address the two sides of us the physical, visible, the human, and the suprahuman or spiritual, from which life emerges into me, you, and him. And, and life, in, in essence, is the same. The way it manifests and the way it experiences what is good and not and what is acceptable or not differs all the time. So for me, that cosmology became very clear in that no one is spared the opportunity. And it has a lot to do with luck and good fortune to see it, understand it, and live it. 
And uh, so that is really a very brief biography as I experience it. That's good. There's a number of points in there that we could elaborate on. Um, well, I suppose one is luck and good fortune. Um, is there really such a thing as luck or is, or or chance or randomness or accident in the universe? Or is, is everything really sort of divinely orchestrated and, um, you know, there's a sort of a, a significance or a an intelligence in every little particle of creation and certainly in every aspect of our own lives? I think both are true. If, if I consider myself lucky, no matter what, even if I lost a leg or whatever, I think that is a good doorway to contentment. Because th these are events you, most of which cannot be reversed. So if you accept it, in a, in a sense, then you can go past into higher zones of, if you like, intelligent perception or, uh, if you like, consciousness. So there is luck in that you are in the right place at the right time at that moment. So things uh, somewhat happen in a far more significant way. But equally, you may consider yourself very lucky for not having been there. So all, both of them can be true. And... If we measure these uh, values with the point of view of the inner and the outer, then I think it becomes easier to understand. Because I have got an inner cosmology which is connected to the infinite and the boundless, it is, so it is absolute. And I have an outer a sense of being in this world at a certain time with a birth and a death and a biography. And the two you know, resonate with each other. Um, once I've got a bit of a stability in the outer sense, then the more I dwell upon my inner state, which we call, if you like, a very high zone of um, meditation, reflection, silence, or all of the other words we use when people talk about, you know, the bliss of awakening or enlightenment and all, all of such words. All what it means is that it is not bound in space and time. It is not describable through sounds or understanding or the intellect or reason. That's really all what I understand by it. And the contrast actually is by uh, seeing the worldly reflection of it and the limitations of those. And the two go together. And I think that is perfection. Yeah, I mean, we use the word enlightenment in the introduction and to my understanding, enlightenment is just kind of what you're describing, where there's an integration of both the outer and the inner. It's not a, a sort of a, a denial or a, a running away from the outer, um, and it's certainly not a oblivion, obliviousness to the inner, but it's a, a full blossoming of both. We, we could even call it 200% of life if we wanted to. True, true, true. That is fulfillment again. And in a, in, a, um, in a sense, we can say that chronologically, you, a child or a baby begins by developing the outer senses, the first few months, um, the cognition of this smell, touch, all of the other things enables the outer senses to develop until one is in teenagers and then other things begin to arise, the desire to be acknowledged and the ego and its demands and, and occasionally a child imagines that it can do anything and it has to be godlike, respected, loved, adored and followed and on and on until we realize that really these are all reflections of what you may term the light of God within or what emanates from the source of life within. And so you realize we are all essentially the same. And if you're fortunate to develop true respect for any anything else living, all life, then I think you are far more honest and uh, reliable and loyal in that sense, loyal to life itself. And then the reflection of it is very different. One minute it is very acceptable, one minute is less, one minute you switch off into dream consciousness and many other levels of consciousness is. So you, you're really given 
glimpses of the cosmologies that I think we all will experience after leaving the screen and the filter of the body and the mind behind. Once we have gone through that into the zone of infinitude, timelessness, boundlessness, with the soul in me, having already been experienced to all of the ups and the downs and the changes, then it is an incredible, I think, ongoingness until the end of the universe. This is what, how I understand it. So the more I can calibrate with the infinitude, the, the less there is interference of the so-called me and my desires and my fears and my culture, the easier that transfer will be. So in a way, I often look at life as a preparation for re-entry into infinite life, having been equipped by realizing all of the values that are relative, that are changing, that are due to millions of different energy beams. But now it is the absolute, perfect, boundless, eternal, which we occasionally touch upon in our life. It's a preparation. I think we are in the second womb, the first one being the motherly womb. The, set, the next one is the earthly womb. Limitation, limitation, every day is different. Every, and yet it's the same because the, my inner drive seeking the same, seeking the security and certainty of that which is boundless and timeless. And that's it. Then the rest becomes easy. And then when in an amazing way, spared a lot of the drudgery of abuse, injustice, stupidities. You won't participate in it. It is of no interest. It's like a child having hobbies at the age of nine, very different to the age of 20, very different when you're in your 50s. The same thing happens. And there is a natural filtering. Nature is the most amazing, amazing, amazing flow of guidance and guideline. But... We are not tuned to it anymore. Our intuitive has been dimmed. <clears throat> and our physical, material fears and anxieties consume a lot of energy. Yeah, when you said guidance, that's, um, that's kind of what I had in mind when we were using the word luck. Because, you know, luck implies a sort of accidental or random or you know, something happening for no reason and just happens. But, you know, my sense is that nothing happens for no reason, that there's this sort of intelligence orchestrating the universe and that we can attune ourselves, we can become attuned to that. And then one's whole life is guided in a, in a very profound way. Um, before you respond to that, I just want to make sure that your scarf isn't covering up your microphone there. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, about the guidance? I think yeah. the word luck is used to describe that, that uh, intellectually or in a conscious way, I'm ignorant. I don't know how it happened. That really is. But otherwise, it is exactly as you said. All the millions of forces that are unknown to me, you know, are, inter uh, are interplaying. And uh, the outcome is that. But I was not aware, I was not conscious, I was not. So I could give it that name. It's a label to describe that I was not cognizant, I was not aware. And so, and a lot of our stuff is subconscious anyway. So much of what happens is, is not very clear. And, and maybe just as well, it gives life another wonderful, mysterious, if you like, uh, drive and flow. And I think it's wonderful that we know very little even if you have physical sciences or chemicals, we know very little. And at the end, we reach a point, we give names and titles, and we think this is what it is. But where is the atom? What is this reality? It ends up being another form of energy which has solidified or something. So this is where we are. We are in a, in a very approximate situation here. Part of it is, yes, discernible, shareable, and much of it is not. And that's, that's mm. it. Some people describe the brain and the sensory systems as filters and very necessary filters because if they didn't filter out most of what's going on, we would be so overwhelmed we wouldn't be able to function. Um, and 
It's interesting, they've, they've done research on psychedelics and they've found that on, under the influence of psychedelics, the, the brain activity is actually decreased rather than increased, even though the sensory input seems to be increased so much. So it's almost like that filtering function of the brain is shutting down and allowing a whole lot more in. Yes. And, uh, and we can relate this back, I think, to the idea of enlightenment, where we actually do become far more aware of everything, and we can elaborate on what that means, uh, and yet the mind is less active, it's more settled, it's more quiet, it's not so cluttered with noise and thoughts. Exactly, that's wonderful. Another way of also looking at it is the physical realities we talk about, chemical realities, all of these realities. They are more discernible. They do follow a certain pattern that we can share. And, and so, but yet, all of it emerges from another reality, if you like, from a quantum field, rather than the physical or chemical field. So the, the issue of challenge in life to be fulfilled fully is to have experiences that these two fields are ever together. They're seamlessly connected. And to recalibrate my physical reality, my likes, dislikes, fears, anxieties, uh, all of the other disturbances, to calibrate that with the quantum field, with the absolute. And that calibration will put things in perspective. So putting things in perspective makes a huge difference in the quality of life and the ease of flow. There comes a point that there is nothing anybody can do about it. So we say these are circumstances, nature's way, or luck, or whatever the name we give it. So as the mind stops searching, looking, or interpreting, or trying to find a different way. So we are really in between the, these two zones of consciousnesses. And in between there are many other sub-zones, like that of sleep, like that of et cetera, et cetera, insights. So we are here being, in a way, more and more and more dependent upon discernible, physical, the five senses, the five inner senses, and all of that. But yet, what matters most is that recalibration and re the touch of the infinite, that the mind cannot touch or has nothing to do with it. But then come back to the mind and it's fine, it's clear. Don't do it, don't worry. And back into supra mind. There is low mind, there is normal mind, there is super mind, and there is a supra. And that is the, the other field you are also alluding to. And it's wonderful. We have to do it consciously. The more often, the better, healthier we will become. In one of your books, I think it might have been your, your biography, Son of Karbala, um, you mentioned uh, a period that you went into, which is sort of a spiritual retreat. It started with a K, the word, I forget the name of the word, but you underwent quite a profound transformation during that period. And I th you can elaborate on how long it was and everything, but I remember you saying that, you know, for months afterwards, it's like, you know, you couldn't really drive or uh, it was just too much to be out right. in the world because the integration hadn't taken place. Um, and, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier today, um, sort of dipping into the absolute or dipping into the unbounded field. Um, but obviously, <clears throat> occasional dips are really not sufficient uh, for fulfillment for what we're talking about. We want it to be a, an abiding reality. And I kind of got the feeling, um, even though I didn't finish your book, but that that, that retreat that you took was a, a big shift for you. And that you know, it sh it enabled you to shift from occasional glimpses to a much more abiding, um, resting in infinity while in the midst of activity. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. It is. I think everybody goes through that to different extent of clarity and understanding. Is we are, I think, are on a ladder of consciousness, climbing higher and higher, subtler and subtler. But every now and then there is a plateau. And what you're describing 
is was part of the Sufi traditions when the teacher or the master saw or felt that a follower or a student is being sufficiently sensitive enough, uh, being already in that in and out of that zone, then they say you are now ready to empty out. The word, as you mentioned, is starts with is called khalwa, to empty out, but to empty out fully, to be not you anymore, lose you, uh, die uh, into the so-called you or the biographical you. So that demarcates, if you like, a clear, uh, clear opening that now, if you like, you have had not just an epiphany, not just, it is now you have had, you know, you have a key to the door into the other consciousness, into the supreme consciousness, into the quantum field, if you like. And from there on, again, there is a continuation, subtler and subtler, different nuances, and on and on and on. So I think the same thing, in my mind, is that of death. It is not the end, it's the beginning. So is this, if you like, breakthrough in, in consciousness. I also had come across many people describing that. The most prominent one, I think, become also very popularly known was Krishnamurti's description of it and so on. So it, it does happen, you know. And with some people is more dramatic, some people less dramatic. And, so, and, and they, are, they take, I think with people who take drugs or ayahuasca or that sort of thing, I've heard a number of similar type of, if you like, bit of descriptions. It is a breakthrough in consciousness. Our normal consciousness is so-called ordinary basic human consciousness is one main strand which enables us to communicate with each other and makes us accountable also with others and so on. But then there are so many other openings that take place, so many other, and some of them, like what you're trying to describe, has a lasting effect. You're no longer the same as you were. Your value system still is remembered, but it, it doesn't move you as it did before. F fear of death, two major things I think happens. One is fear altogether, and, uh, and the other one is sorrow. Both of them, in a way, they won't disappear fully as long as one is alive. They touch you, but they don't overwhelm you. And so it, it, the, pro, the progress after this, if you like, crack in consciousness is refinement, 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 refinement. And the Sufi language also is called polishing, polishing, polishing until that's it. See? And then, then I think then you are really a worthy human being then you are, uh, but also, thank God, most people run away from you. They, they don't find you interesting. You see, that's it's a big gift. They, don't, <laughs> they want to go to the, <laughs> to the club and whatever. So you are spared in order for you to excel more and more in that wonderful twilight. Well, the people who are attracted to going to clubs may run away from you, but obviously people who are attracted to the kind of experience you're having tend to recognize you as having it, you know, and so they get attracted to you and, uh, you know, they seek you out. True. And uh, in my earlier days, I was very pleased with that. But as I grew a bit older, I was indifferent. Now, actually, I prefer without it. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, in, one, in one of your books, you told a story about this prince who uh, was supposed to inherit the kingdom, but he was this really spiritual guy and he didn't want to run a kingdom, he just wanted to do spiritual practice. So he went off to the mountains and lived in a cave. But, you know, due to his charisma and his sort of spiritual magnetism, a whole village ended up building itself up around him anyway, and he ended up ruling that as an enlightened prince. So he couldn't escape his dharma, you know. True. The attitude is what matters most. If you just accept it and leave it, that's fine. Uh, earlier on, because one is seriously trying to focus on the infinite, so you are you shun the the human side of it or the. Uh, but later on, 
with fortune again, with good fortune, with with effort, with grace. Grace is the ultimate thing, actually. It's not luck or anything else. You don't mind it anymore. And then it takes its own um, flow. And then it's it works out better. That's why people say in the presence of a, an awakened or enlightened, whatever name we give it, being, things happen differently. It isn't that things happen differently. It's our perception of them. <laughs> because we are a little bit more tuned to the highest sense in our consciousness. And things are the are things, you know, but, you know, we perceive them different. Our energy changes, therefore the birds behave differently. But that's why, how it is, you see. It, it, it has, uh, it's a different atmosphere, a, a different uh, ambience, and it's true. And we, in order for us to go into a higher zone of consciousness, we try to create those ambiences with silence, incense, whatever else, so that we lose our mind. But the mind is the barrier with the infinite that's actually causing it to be a mind. So these are certain, as I said earlier, what appears to be in, uh, in opposition or in dichotomy, but they're not. They're all seamlessly connected. Yeah, I remember hearing a story of a saint who reportedly in his vicinity of a couple miles radius, the animals wouldn't fight with each other. They wouldn't kill each other just because of the influence that he radiated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing that these radiuses differ. You know, it depends. Maybe one day comes when there are millions of so-called enlightened people. Everybody's giving a certificate of a radius. You know, I am five mile person. <laughs> I'm a 10 meter. Well, person. you know, I think if we had millions, then the world would be blanketed with coherence and we wouldn't have all the problems Allah. that we have now. Allah. Just that real awareness of the higher self, accountability and honesty, much things will change. But honesty requires a lot of courage because then there is no so called I know one doesn't try to cover anything. Well, that's how it is. And with it comes great contentment. Yeah, I've heard you speak about how you feel that the world is undergoing um, really dramatic transformation right now, dramatic, shi a dramatic shift. And uh, perhaps we could talk about that a little bit, about what, what we really think is going on in the world and what the causes of it are and what, the, what direction it's heading in. Are you oh yeah, you're still there. <laughs> um, well, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of people think that there's some kind of age of enlightenment dawning, or that you know we're moving into a, a, a new age or a brighter time, and and you know, other people think that everybody's going to die because climate change is beyond our beyond hope of re reversal, and uh, you know, I, I think that. Either is a possibility, but from my perspective, if I didn't know about all this spiritual stuff happening all over the world, I might take the more pessimistic view. But the fact that there seems to be such a huge upwelling of awakening taking place, I think that may end up really turning the tide. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. I think exactly as you described. We really are not sure, but definitely uh, things are converging globally. A uh, hundred years ago, the issue of particular local situation of a religion or a culture or a diet or a ray or a color were very important. So we are moving very rapidly towards a much more of a human universal acceptance, tolerance, respect. I think that in itself is a clear indication of the rapid growth, if you like, of evolution and awakening to the higher within us. And uh, I think it's happening very rapidly. And with it comes a lot of stress and strain and a lot of also suffering because of ignorance, because of lack of flexibility, lack of acceptance that in truth, what we have in our hand is very little. And that is don't cause m m more damage. Don't cause waste. Don't do this. Be accountable. Why are you doing this? Why are you turning the earth upside down to catch more minerals to do this and that? All opportunities for 
material, if you like, growth and richness and so on. And look at us now. Outwardly, we are very rich. Inwardly, and even outwardly to a great extent, in terms of locale, location, we're very poor. And so the contrast is going, is bringing shocks everywhere. That's why the very wealthy people who don't want to see the other side of human misery and difficulty try to isolate themselves, and, and so on and so forth. I think as a major, if you like, movement within that rush of evolvement, awakening, touching the highest, is very much there now than it had been. And that is why it brings a lot of stresses, social stresses, economic stresses, religious stresses, and all of the other things. Unless you're touching the universal spirit within within one, and that universal spirit is universal, and then you accept anything, then you really are more aware of the signals that are coming from beyond our tiny little earth twirling around itself in a, in a galaxy, which is one of billions of galaxies, and on and on. And on. So putting things in perspective, I think the difficulties that we, we are facing now, the uncertainties, are celebratory, to my mind. I really celebrate them. That means I now have to be more sensitive more alert, less egotistically demanding, less conditional as to what constitutes a good life for me or not. No, it is life itself, not my life. The more I abandon my life into life itself, the more I can see also what is happening as one side of it that can bring in difficulties to human beings, but the other side, it has its own purpose, which is a relief from all the stupidities that we as animals are naturally endowed with. Yeah, perspective. I, I love that word. And uh, in addition to my daily meditation practice of you know, a couple hours, two, three hours a day, I, uh, I intentionally look at pictures of galaxies and I sort of take my mind and kind of extend it out, you know, just in my imagination, I guess, to, you know, solar system, gal you know, galaxy, clusters of galaxies, whole universe, and just sort of go through that. And, and uh, every, twice a day I do that, just to, uh, just to kind of keep it in perspective and, and I sort of realize the, how vast it all is by comparison with whatever little thing I may happen to be experiencing. Wonderful. One great, great, great if you like, reference to the perspective is the ability to switch off the mind completely. It's all right to be mindful because of the focus, and but more important, I think, is to be mindless, no mind. Complete switch. And what you are practicing is that, in a way. It's, I think we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our soul, we owe it to our spirit, we owe it to the divine light in us or life in us to do that. So that is actually reverencing, being, expressing reverence to that, expressing our subservient to that vast, infinite absoluteness. And that is, I think, as I said, it's a big source of health and inner wealth also. Yeah, there's a, there's a line in, uh, I don't know whether it's the Upanishads or the Brahma Sutras or something, but the line is, there's no joy in smallness. Even in bigness, it must be beyond yeah, yeah. bigness, it must be Good beyond point. size. Yeah. It must be n not connected in any way to space or time, because that is the womb we are all in. Yeah. Um, oh. Now, I know, you know, at one point you had a, a Hindu teacher, um, Swami Chinmayananda, I believe his name was. And uh, so you've had a lot of influences. And, and at one point then he told you, OK, you've learned enough from me, now go explore your 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 you know sufi and and muslim roots and you know really understand that deeply um so what were some of the practices you've done either from swami chinmayananda or that you learned in the sufi tradition that gave you access to this 
you know, absolute or unbounded awareness or universal consciousness or whatever you want to call it. What sort of daily practices facilitated that in your experience? You know, I had really two fathers, one physical and the other one was Chinmayananda. Uh, my physical father, his own life, his own character, quality, his own status. He was also considered at his time for his people to be at a very high, high rank of rank of spiritual awakening. Even the, because um, I remember I was a youngster, at that time Iraq was a kingdom, the king every now and then would send his personal emissary, would come quietly and they sit together and they chat, asking certain questions about whatever it is that will help people reduce. And Chirmayananda really taught me that the courtesy of a grown-up person, maturity, keep quiet, don't do it. And it was really much more imbibing by following him. At that time, I was a management consultant in England. And uh, whatever time I could take off, two weeks at a time, a month at a time, I will just pack my bag and jump into whatever the nearest flight to Mumbai and be with him. I knew where he would be. And so on average, maybe two months, three months a year, I would just be with him, you know. And... Uh, of course, it was very odd to all of the other, you know, other Hindu, because he was surrounded by wonderful sannyas and others, quality of the traditional way, high discipline. And so they would suddenly see this fellow emerging there. And, and of course, there was a very special link. Chinmay obviously must have enjoyed this youngster seeking something, looking for. So I would be with him wherever he's traveling. And so it was companionship. It was being on a day-to-day -day basis, there would have been maybe easily one or two hundred incidents which cannot appear in a book or anywhere. It is his his life, his conduct, his, his courtesy towards life and the essence of life, his respect for the ordinary people and the constant referencing to the absolute. Whenever there were difficulties in the numerous situations, whether it was a hospital in particular case, because he ran quite a number of hospitals, clinics, and other charity. And people are people, so they, um, they are ambitious. So the head of the department has died, and there were six other assistants jockeying for the position, and there was chaos. So immediately he goes there, and I would be with him, sitting quietly, nobody knows what, pretending that I maybe carry, because he had no bag either. So I was, I, I was a companion, travel companion. So, and... Uh, he tells them, say, look, you, you could have earned far more. You could have done anywhere, anywhere else. You've come here because the ambience is different. You're serving to get out of your animal self. You're giving charity with it in order for you to discover your spiritual, your, your real self. So, you know, if you want to compete, if you want money, if you want position, please go somewhere. Anyway, soon they will quieten down and they're all agreeable. Nobody actually wants to have that position. And then Quietly, he turns to me, he says, Sonny, we better leave before the, the, the ego comes back. You know, things like <laughs> these for me were great. The ego is there as long as anybody's breathing. So I learned a lot by that quiet companionship. That is really for me was the ultimate. Because earlier on, I was so much taken by the state he was in. I knew this man knows, and yet he says, I know nothing. So knowing nothing is the other side of the coin of having access to that zone of knowledge of everything. So, but he did not encourage me one bit to learn Sanskrit, to go in anything, change anything, talk about it. He said, you have it all, just keep quiet. So, I mean, that was a, a very high station beyond religion, beyond culture, beyond methodology. So, and for me, it was completely done. I mean, I was... I would, could never find anyone of that stature, really, of, of reference to the absolute. And when he passed, I didn't feel he's absent. I really don't. Nor was it an emotional issue. Of, I'm having dreams of him or vision, none of that. It was a natural flow. It is as though my own, you know, soul managed to see beyond the veil of personality. So it was the same. Without trying to you know, build my spiritual ego up or whatever. 
it was, I felt that's it. That's, that's, it's already there. I have to stop being here, there, everywhere in confusion. It's really, uh, it's my human side needs to be, you know, made subservient to the spirit within me without denying it. Otherwise, it can com come back in, in a greater rampage. You know. Feed the beast, keep it in the zoo, and, <laughs> and walk in the garden. Yeah, I remember you saying in one interview that in, I guess it's the Muslim tradition, it's consider maybe maybe even Prophet Muhammad said it in the Quran, but that when somebody dies, it's completely appropriate to grieve for three days and recognize the, the person's life. But after that, what what purpose is there of grief? Because actually, in a way, you should be celebrating because they are in a much happier place than they were. And, um, you know, just f f from our perspective, it might seem, oh, we miss them, but if we actually think about what they are probably experiencing, um, it's almost a cause for celebration. Indeed. And in the Sufi tradition, which is essentially, it is original Islamic tradition, but the majority went more and more towards a ritual, towards an institutionalized, towards organized religion. And so the Sufis still refer to whatever left of Sufism, to the, uh, de the death of a master, the death of wedding. Because that means that the soul is now really is at one with its origin, with its mate. So it is celebration. It is a relief. But the specific teaching you referred to earlier on is, is that three days of griefing is about the limit. Nothing more than that. Get back into the so-called normal. So as you may, if you are fortunate to have a touch an understanding of the grace of the supranormal, which is within you, which is life itself, which is the soul or the spirit within the heart. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned the Sufis and you just indicated that the tradition has deteriorated somewhat, let's, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. Um, you know, here in the West, um, especially since 9 11, there's a lot of anti Muslim sentiment among certain types of people. And, you know, they think of Al Qaeda and the Taliban and all that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people who don't know any better lump the whole religion into those types of groups, you know. And, uh, and then people who are on more of a spiritual path, um, they think, oh, Sufism, okay, that's the mystical core of it, and that must be good, and Rumi was wonderful, and Kabir, and, uh, you know, Hafiz, and, and all these guys. Um, but then even, I've never read the Quran, but just reading in your book and reading some of the quotes that you quoted from it, uh, they're just as profound and beautiful as anything you'd find in Vedic literature, or Christian literature, or anything else. Um, so I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this question, but may, perhaps you could say something to dispel in the minds of anyone who may be listening who has a less than realistic or less than deep, uh, who has a shallow understanding of the um, Islamic tradition. Uh, maybe you could dispel some of that and deepen their understanding and their appreciation of it by some things you could tell us. Uh, you know, the whole thing is a spectrum. At one end of it, all of these so-called paths, religions, declarations have emanated from the same light. So there is a not sameness, they're exactly from the same light. They are this, with us, as light recedes, it becomes slightly different in its hue or, or its texture or in its whatever. So. In essence, we are now beginning, I think, to see individual followers of these different paths beginning to recognize that original essence in them being the same. More and more and more. It wasn't the case even 100 years ago. So it's happening in its own way. As for the Islamophobia or other phobias that are natural again, it's part of evolution. I think less and less people are going to be swamped by that. 
more and more, I think you'll find the leadership beginning to recognize that this earth of ours is a place where everyone can do whatever they can to excel to their utmost. And the ultimate excellence is to awakening to that which is permanent, eternal, and that life on this earth and life after death are seamlessly connected in a way. So I think it's happening. And uh, I think the animosities, the differences is, is understandable because the openings of the nation states accepting others, immigrants, poverty, and bigotness, bigotry is understandable. But I think it, it will die out. I think, I imagine not so much in the long-term future. I think within two, three, four generations. I think I already see it. People are doing well in this world, healthy, happy, content, and fulfilled. There are people who have religious practice. They do have inner calibration. They learn how to constantly refer to silence and put things in perspective. And, uh, you know, so that is the universality of the being. But equally, they have some skills that are helpful, useful to improve the quality of outer life. I think it's happening. I see it all around. But equally, I think we see, of course, we news are new simply because they, they've got something scary in them. Because we are, we want to survive. So the only news that interests me is how far is the enemy? Are they next door? How, or are, have they been occupied by the next you know, tribe? Or are they right into our tribe? So it is that. That's why bad news always prevails. But the good news is that more and more we are connecting worldwide into marriages, relationships, travel, understanding. And more and more people want to get out of their own personal misery. So people are willing to take anything that, you know, that's why also so many of these physical practices of uh, transcend the mind, whether it's coming from Peru or anywhere else, say, please give it to me. I, I've had enough. I can't survive. So anything would just, I have to stop the noise. I have to, so I think we are living in a most wonderful time. Outwardly, with all its difficulties, I can see the rapid openings of human consciousness and the supra-consciousness of the spiritual life in us. That's great. I know here in the U.S. I, they say that um, fundamentalism is in decline, you know. The, a lot of the churches are getting more and more empty and a lot of people are just sort of becoming what they call spiritual but not religious. They, they sort of appreciate that religion, all religions have a spiritual core to them, but they don't. They, they feel more universal in their appreciation and are willing to, uh, you know, take honey from all the flowers that you know that blossom around the world. Yes, it is true. I think the same applies to any religion. The same thing with mosques. The same thing with synagogue. You know, it 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 has served its purpose. All of these. Great purposes have been served by making us a better, better human beings, more tolerant, more honest, more accepting, more generous. But now I think it can't stay anymore in one building. Because if there is a building, I have to give it a name. If you give it a name, it's limiting. So we say we are spiritual. That means, you know, partly also it can mean I can fool around without being reprimanded by a religious authority. That's also a danger. But no, it's happening. I think humans now are openly, wherever you go in the world, you find people like that seeking a state that they can touch, tap into, that reduces the challenges of the outer world, misery, suffering, fear, and so and all of that. It's happening. It's happened already. Here we are two talking from what background? What 50 years ago it may not have been at all conceivable. Look. And what medium we are using. It's amazing. We have to celebrate the emergence of this animal being into the origin of the light that gives it life. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting how there's this upwelling of spirituality in the world. And at the same time, there's a um, 
accelerating development of technologies which enable that spirituality to spread far and wide. You know, even 20 years ago, we could, or even 10 years ago when I started this thing, I could barely do it given the technologies, and now it's just so much easier and getting easier all the time. But equally, there is a dark side to anything. So no matter what, there is a dark side to it as well. It can be abused as it has in many ways to degrade us also, to bring us back into a very low animal state as well. So that also is there. But the, the arc of the rise in consciousness is clear. It is rising upward back to origin, which is the same as destiny. So we are unifying with, with if you like, of timelessness and boundlessness, which is the nature of our own soul. Now, the only Sufi practice that I'm familiar with, um, I've, I've interviewed Kabir Helminski, and I've also interviewed Llewellyn Von Lee, um, but it, the main one that most people are familiar with is the, the whirling dervishes, you know? Um, yes. Uh, was that part of your practice, or and if not, uh, what practices? No, I, I, get, I get dizzy <laughs> if I do that. Right. Yeah, I tried it once. I got dizzy too. It has become too. a bit of an entertainment, but a good entertainment. Not really, no. I never cared for labels also. You know, really. So I, didn't, I really cared for the state and how can I touch that state of infinitude or eternity or timelessness. That is really my interest. No, I... You know, many of such practices also in the Sufi traditions, even if you take Sufism as a uh, academic, if you like, uh, issue, you find many of these have occurred after the person is gone. Somebody heard, I said, said somebody said, so, and uh, so not really. You know, I've never cared for outer practices except accountability. What am I doing? How can I justify it, explain it? If not, if not right, get out of it, apologize, you know, don't mess about, don't create more havoc. In other words, nature will prevail. And nature is having a little swirl here in this world, and in that are human beings. For them to be in that laundromat, turning, turning, and to wake up that all of it was light. There was hardly any, you may have a faint memory of the you, but who is the you? Where is the you now? Why do we love deep sleep? Where are you in it? So these were what, what really, in a way, drove me towards not just Sufism, people, anywhere. You know, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever. So it is just, look, I, I need to have indications if I'm on the right path of fulfilling, if you like, my little, little journey on earth without losing also uh, the context, without losing the earthly part, the love for the sound, the color, the music, the birds, without losing any of that. They are all symbols and indicators of that garden which we talk about as paradise or something, which we are yearning for. So it's not the physical garden, it's a state. So it's the state of the garden within me that I've been looking for. And it was there that meant I should be less distracted for, for other things. No distraction for anything else. Focus, stay still, wait until the right breeze of grace comes and you suddenly find there is only the garden. The hell that you were experiencing was tiny little hell within the vast garden, that's all. If you've never cared much for outer practices, what inner practices have you employed? You just kind of described something, but is there something you teach your students, for instance, that you can sort of give in formal instruction that people can take away and then you know, do on a daily basis? Not really. I was fortunate not to be... See, I never accepted the time I came in around. I knew days for formal gatherings, formal community, it, 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 it has, it can bring about with this a touch of cultism, which I don't accept. So I never did, except that there are a dozen usual practices of concentrating on the breath, the posture, the 
position, silence of the mind, going into lights. I myself found the love of nature was very helpful. I could always sit, visualize a horizon on an ocean and just imagine things emerging from it just to keep the mind a bit occupied and then silence it. Silence really for me, any technique that takes that person into quick switch off, complete switch off. And that is where you can recalibrate, you can in every way have the right perspective because you're no longer into the mental arena of good and bad and up and down. So you leave that for a little while and then you come back to it. I've never, you know, I asked whoever was asking the question, what is easiest for you to shut up, keep quiet? Oh, really, <laughs> chanting helps a lot to have a bit of self-hypnosis or mesmerism. Did you learn some practices from Swami uh, Chinmayananda? A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And the Sufis. I found at the end just the word Allah mm. was enough. Like I'm using it like a mantra. It. Allah, 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 Allah. Mentally as well as Allah, as, Allah. as well as vocally, do you do that just sort of on a mental level? Mental, I try to be silent. Let the sound penetrate, and no thought, no mind. Initially, if one is too ag agitated, it's helpful to paint it on right. the horizon. Yeah. Such a big pain that overwhelms you. So you lose yourself into the into that. I'd done that quite a bit earlier on. It's painted different colors, on and on until I lose myself and I lose the sound. Also, it's about losing the self, really. Losing the small self. Um, a couple of questions came in from people in the UK. Um, one is from Muhammad in Manchester. He said, uh, "How did Imam Ali influence your spiritual journey?" He was a master of it, of his time, where there was a great deal of darkness. Human beings were emerging from a very rough and a very gross, if you like, way of life and way of thinking. So he was an amazing example of a being on the edge of the desert, being almost fully enlightened, awakened, and, and yet being in this world and able to also help people to have less suffering and so on. So I think Imam Ali is definitely is one of the greatest being if you have more of those teachings, more of the thing. I think it is it gives us the best quality of conduct. So that's what Imam Ali represents in a way. Were you with him in person or is he more of an historical figure? No, he's a historical figure except his he he was a companion of the Prophet oh, I see. 100 okay. years ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the prophet is something else because there are some other association of uh, miraculous way of life and so on. Whereas this being was a human being also, not pretending. So, But his life was that which encompassed, if you like, the light of prophethood and yet available, accessible and all there. So, And there are many people actually within the Islamic tradition have that profile in every way they they exemplify the humanity but in reference in calibration in, in to divinity so these two so there are many many such examples the others you mentioned i think there are hundreds of people like rumi not as famous but there are many 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 others who are quiet and silent you know one of my main beings who had influenced me a lot is a man called Nifari. Now ask out of 100 Muslims, what you tell me about Nifari, I doubt if one of them can tell you much. Really. <laughs> but Nifari was this was an amazing being about a thousand years ago. Uh, most of his life was in Cairo. He had a family, he was well to do. But all what you have in the biography is that he was hardly at home. He'd go away to the desert for a few weeks. When he comes back, there are a few scraps of paper in his pocket. He brings them out. And after a few days, he goes back again where he don't know where or for how long. And eventually, I think his grandson put all of this work together 
and a magnificent book of two sections was produced. One of them is where I was stopped, Mawa in Arabic. So suddenly I hear, I, I'm told. Another one is exchange. And uh, a great British scholar actually translated it into English. So there are, very, there are many people within traditions, not only Islamic, I'm sure many, many others that have lived a life in their time was a little bit unusual, but very full life. And so th this is what it is, you know, to live your life he here without denying, without denial of the outer need, without den denial of my shaitan, is the dark side of Rahman. Rahman is the all merciful. Shaitan is the all. <laughs> They're always together. We have to accept duality and accept the drive to seeing duality with the lens of unity. That's all. Once you begin to see that, then you know, you're more content. Your, your focus becomes different from acquisitiveness, the love for power, the love for, the love for beautiful things. It becomes beauty itself. Beauty is the source of it all. So you're no longer anymore uh, you know, on, on, on journeys. You're in, at all times uh, allowing the inner lights of your own inner life to show you, to, to guide you, to enjoy. It's enjoyment, enjoyment, even of pain. Without pain, I would lose my hand. So my finger got caught. I have to celebrate it. But look at this amazing nervous system that reminded me that watch out, you lose your hand. It is celebration, but in pain. And so on and so on. Our way of looking at everything changes, you see. So coming close to death, some people say, oh, poor fellow is about to die. But the fellow is the, really was himself graced. He will celebrate. He said, look here, I am ahead of you all. <laughs> you know, I don't need to see. <laughs> Soon I'll be rid of you all <laughs> by leaving the body behind. The mind is gone anyway, but the body you have to take care of if you please. Thank you. <laughs> really? Yeah, and people often have very profound experiences as they're approaching death. And of course, the people who have near-death experiences, who pretty much die and come back, they, they all say, whoa, I, you know, sorry I had to come back. That was wonderful. <laughs> I enjoyed very much the practice during the month of Ramadan, like this month, that a few years I practiced it, that every day, few times, would I have the right state of losing my mind of myself. I would put myself in my grave and dress up quietly and I and I say thank you very much. Your eyes were wonderful. Thank you. Help me a lot. The ears. Thank you. All my senses. You were wonderful. The body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I pat it a bit. And I say now go. And I have that near death experience. It's very not wonderful. You don't know where you are. You don't know who you are. There is no you. It's only a short term aberration. Of a bit of matter, a bit of chemistry, a bit of biology got together, and a bit of fantastic, you know, complexity of the neurons and the brain, then it becomes me. And then I become egotistic. They didn't respect me. Who is the you? You know, you know so often I joke that, you know, you are a mobile septic tank. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> so you have to laugh at it, really, and be relieved of, of the illusion that you are this, that, and the other. All of those have been touched by the real spirit, by you. But you are essentially a cosmic being on a short journey on this earth. That's all. Yeah, there's that, fa there's that popular saying that, you know, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, you know? Correct. How unfortunate, how dreadful earthly experience. Correct. <laughs> I see it that way. Um, okay, so you mentioned... Um, suffering and you know putting your hand on the stove and pulling it back obviously that's a good we're, we're, we're glad we have the ability to feel pain otherwise we lose our hand um, but how about you know more chronic suffering um, chronic diseases or people being born in horrible situations and living in refugee camps and starving and you know all the suffering now COVID in India all the suffering that happens in the world is, do you see some kind of 
cosmic justification for all of that? Justification means cause and effect. A lot of suffering is human, if you like, related. Much of the global suffering, climate change, a lot of all this is our right. abusiveness. Consequences of our behavior. So it's a, in a way, the, yeah, it, there is suffering, but there is also a grace in it that it's, if you like, nature is showing us how abusive we have been. We look at the tree and we immediately imagine the, a chair and a thing and a utility. So there is a lot of this suffering is due to, if you like, human criminality, lack of awareness, lack of responsibility, you know, accountability, honesty, all of that. But then there are other things within nature, as you mentioned, people are born with certain deficiencies, biological, hereditary, and so on. That also is there. So that can be partly for us also to take notice, help, serve, and also consider the metaphor that it could have been me, could have been you. So, but for the individual, I came across so many people who in my eyes were suffering from loss of a, something or another. But in their state, when they are really in a more tranquil state, they're quite happy with it. They accept it. It doesn't mean that there isn't pain. It doesn't mean there is. There is. But with it comes other things as well. It's not, not easy for a person to put oneself in other person's shoes. Not easy. But there is this, the curve of normality of human being or physical well-being has got the two sides quite wide also. So there is a lot of that not so normal. I also met people, the mother being quite a high caliber being, a child who, who was born with deficiency. They see much beauty, much amazing things that with the normal eye we don't. So there is that. This is part of nature. So there is nature, if you like, what you consider to be in peak or not peak or low or high. But then the, the global situation we are now, all of us are being afflicted with, much of it is due to human stupidity, ignorance, abuse, greed, and all of the other things because of the lack of distribution of wealth. You have immense wealth, and you have, as a result of it, the counter side, immense poverty. And I think these will, will have to be equalized. And I think governments to be stable will have to do something on, on these issues. But because they want to have the elite remaining at that top in order to drive the economy, as they say, so it's allowed, allowed, allowed. It can't last. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I heard that just during the pandemic, uh, 600 people in the United States have made over $2 trillion. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many million each that is, but, you know, a billion each. But um, it's, uh, there's a huge wealth disparity. And uh, I know we don't want to get into politics too much here, but it seems to me that's one of the, that and climate change and a number of other things that are one of the sort of critical problems that are somehow going to have to be resolved if humanity is to continue along. I'm sure it's beyond us now. I think we have gone overboard. So whatever is going to happen, how far is the, is the how far or modest or partial is the extinction? As you said earlier, we really don't know. We, but certainly things are not going to be normal. It's not going to be the usual thing. Everybody has gone and, and more holidays, more waste, more drink, more this. It can't be. It may take a decade or two for the dust to settle down. But we have, the especially the political side, we have promised human beings all kinds of vulgar, if you like, entertainment. It's not going to work. It can't be. And it's not about bringing about very, if you like, genteel, boring, <laughs> moral way of life. It's not that. It has to be exhilarating. It has to be, you have to be thrilled by, by sight, by insight, more insight and loss of sight and being at one with the original sight. So these are the things. It will come in its own way. I think we're going through a very difficult period of uncertainty and on the face of it, loss of spiritual or religious interest. But in reality, human suffering will have to find a way
to accept the original offering. See, and I think it will happen. Mm. Yeah, I'm optimistic. Um, yeah. Good. <laughs> I don't know how long you and I will be around, but it could well be that within our lifetime we'll, we'll see even more dramatic uh, changes. You know, the, they say the darkest hour is always before the dawn, and it could be the dawn is, is coming sooner than we think. I think so. Also, they may be already happen many dawns. Very true. We can't, it's not, many, many, many things. And I already I accept exactly as you say, and we have to do what we can. I have to save myself from myself, and then I begin to see things are not as yeah. bleak as, as yeah. we think. Um, it's good we're saying this, you know, because I know that, again, during the pandemic, there's been an uptick in uh, depression and suicide and things like that. So a lot of people must have a very bleak perspective to feel that way. And uh, I think anything that we can say or do to uplift people's perspective and to give them hope is um, is worth doing. Except that if somebody is being egotistic and suffering and so on, the best, the natural way is to allow them to suffer more until a point is reached that it begins to look for its opposite side of the coin. In other words, just to relieve suffering, just to relieve, as I said earlier, the pain in my hand was a great blessing upon me for me to not to lose my hand. So it, everything has its own timing and its own situation. Some people need to suffer a bit more before, as they say, the penny drops. So who am I to interfere? You know, I, what license do I have? So I must take, if you like, I must take reference to the authority. The authority is the absolute. The authority is the eternal light. That may be that this whole half of the world or all the world or, whatever, or few other planets may have to be destroyed. Yeah, we can never I'm tell. I'm sure it happens every day somewhere in the universe. Some, in, some inhabited planet Constantly. gets blown to bits. Absolutely. So I have to take, take reference. My judgment of human suffering, so what? Human is one aspect of life. How much suffering have we as humans inflicted upon other animals? What we are doing? Our... our our huge industries, because of we, the, our love for meat, and anyway, on and on, and we have we have become we have played demigods. We have taken it upon ourselves. We can fix it, but we haven't fixed ourselves. Here we are trying all the way to get out of this planet after almost ruining it, just to get somewhere else and start again. <laughs> really, it's <laughs> ludicrous. I know they're talking about <laughs> making Mars inhabitable. Well, how about? How about That's making right. Earth habitable? I, I meant to say habitable, uh, not exactly. Um, and you know, this thing you said about suffering and bottoming out, you know, maybe we need to suffer more. I mean, that, they say that all the time about alcoholics. They, sometimes they just need to hit a bottom, rock bottom, before they'll have the motivation to turn it around. There are, the, there are these cycles in human beings. But, you know, it's difficult for us with empathy to just sit still and see somebody is is crying with pain and so on. We immediately want to do something because we put ourselves in their positions. So it's natural, yeah, it's natural for us to reduce suffering. There's a story about a saint. He was sitting by the roadside and someone was observing him and he kept like doing something and then crying out in pain. And so the guy came closer to see what he was doing. And it turned out there was a scorpion that kept falling into the ditch. And he kept pulling him out of the ditch so he wouldn't drown, but the, then the scorpion would sting him. And then he'd pull him out, the scorpion would go back to the ditch, the saint would pull him out again. This happened several times, and the guy said, why are you doing that? He keeps stinging you. And the, the saint said, well, it's his nature to sting, it's my nature to save. How brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I'm neither the saint nor the scorpion. <laughs> yeah, most of us are in between. <laughs> really, I don't... It's not my nature. My nature is light, and I have to be honest to that. That's it. <laughs> Do uh, Islam and uh, Sufism have a concept of karma the way Hinduism does? You see, again, these words become cultural. It's not quite the same, but cause and Similar effect. Similar idea. Yes. Everything has, yes. It may show now, it may show later, it may show, you know, whatever. So there is, of course, there, you know, 
um, Hinduism really is, is a vast, vast, if you like, heritage. So it contains much of what later on became of a different culture or compartment. Yeah. Of course they do. You can, nothing escapes. No matter what I think, whatever I touch, whatever I think that I do has a balance, has a right. counter. How about reincarnation? What's, what's the perspective on that? You know, the general... Uh, cultural is Islamic perspective is that it is not across the board, but there are indications that it can happen and it does happen. And the Quran even uses that word. They are being brought up, brought back as dogs or as as a song. So, so it leaves a window, it leaves an uh, opening for that. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it does help to answer some questions about the fairness of life and the, the, the nature of spiritual progress, since obviously most people don't make all the possible spiritual progress that could be made in just one lifetime. So, you know, it kind of gives you that perspective. Um, yeah, but also it continues after death. The issue of hell and paradise is almost finishing right. it off, you know. And the, the Quran also tells us that those who have experienced brilliant beauty of earthly gardens and paradise, when they are in the eternal garden, they say, we have experienced all of this before. <laughs> so it, there's a continuation. It happens after, you know, leaving the body, some in between stage, and then then continues uh -huh. after that. Okay. Purgatory, right. in a way. Yeah, that way we could talk about that for two hours, but we won't dwell on it. Um, <laughs> another question from the UK, from Stephen. Um, given that many male spiritual teachers put forth the understanding that, quote, we are God, all God's creatures, end quote, then why is it that females have been so excluded from spiritual leadership, not to mention the separation, division, and disrespect shown to females. What is your view of this cultural division? What can be done to balance the schism? Uh, I struggle to understand this. Well, I think the way it's going soon, males will be hoping to have some sort of equality because females are leading everywhere. It is an evolutionary thing, you know. A thousand years ago, they, they, they specialized more and more into reproduction, more and more keeping the home, more and more whatever. But it has changed. So, as I said, maybe another two, three generations, you find a lot of males hoping, praying, requesting uh, more equality. So it is like that. It's, it's a historical issue. And uh, the patriarchal domination and so on has reached a point where it's no longer. So it's, I feel we've come mm. a long way. Are there some more liberal branches of Sufism, for instance, or anything in this tradition where, you know, you have the equivalent of women priests or imams or something? Not so much in the public, because that is different. You don't forget the outer environment is very yeah. harsh. So it was manly, manly, you know, all of that. And uh, but the, in terms of teachings, in terms of transmission, in terms of helping others to awaken to the higher, very much so. It are, but it is kept a bit hush-hush because of the patriarchal thing. So it's not very much, if you like, right in the up, up front. But you have great beings from historical point of view. Uh, Ibn Arabi is a very prominent one and many others who claim that his main teachers earlier on were women. So it's never, but it was quiet. It was not in the front, as I said, because of the harsh environment, harsh deserts, difficult, and so on. So a woman was, it was in fact, was revered more, respected more. So she was not right in the front. <clears throat> she didn't have to do all the dirty work. <laughs> exactly, and, and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Exposure to the hmm. outer elements. Um, there's one one point that was sent to me of you know talking points we could discuss, and and that is. Does liberation truly make you free? What do you mean by liberation? What do you mean by freedom? That is this, the state of my spirit or my soul. It's not subject to space and time, to any limitations of 
you know, either of these two major, major constraints. So ultimate liberation is transcending beyond this womb of space and time. And we're all aspiring for that. Liberation, freedom, there's no such thing. I am, I am a spirit or a soul which is in its own state fully liberated, but caught for a while and trapped in a while in this body and the mind. That's all. True liberation only comes when I leave the body and the mind. That's the soul. But the so-called me, which is a combination of a divine light and entity called soul and the bovine entity that grew up with evolution, the so-called me, the animal me, the combination of these two is constrained. That's all what it is. The best liberation I have is conscious silence or deep sleep when there is no movements. This is the nearest I get to touching the boundaries of beyond space and time. Otherwise, I'm here constrained. Have I explored all the possibilities now? That's the issue. Accepting my limitations opens, opens up for me many, many great, if you like, lights and delights. Well, you know, obviously we're all constrained in certain ways. We can't walk through walls or lift automobiles or, you know, fly through the air or whatever. But, um, you know, don't you feel a sort of inner liberation that um, persists regardless of, you know, your physical limitations or whether you're healthy or not or all those things? I mean, hasn't the kind of an inner freedom dawned for you? after all these years? I, I get the impression it has. Sure, inner liberation is what has another name. We call it your soul, your spirit, the divine light in you, whatever name you give it. That's what, that is inner liberation. It, that entity, which is the source of my own life and life experiences, is not constrained by space and time, except for the temporary period in which it's trapped in me. So I feel sorry for my soul. I apologize to it for a, for a short while. You're trapped in me. I don't know how it happened. I don't know what were the amazing mechanisms in the womb before, after what. But at least I can apologize on behalf of. <laughs> so that is beyond liberation. I, as a human being, aspiring liberation, meaning in a sense, I am aspiring to the real me, the permanent me, the eternal me, which is not me. It is a divine light in me. Yeah. And, you know, when you dip into the transcendent, it's not trapped, right? I mean, it's there. It's free. It's always been free. It just appeared to be trapped. And, uh, and when you had that 40-day retreat or whatever it was that starts with a K, um, it sounded to me like there was some kind of breakthrough uh, so that it really wasn't trapped at all anymore, or at least not, not very much. And, you know, as we know from Hindu and Buddhist uh, traditions, liberation is considered to be something that uh, can be attained while we are alive, not just something to look forward to after we die. I say it is exactly as you say, but it is the knowledge of that entity or that state within me which is not subject to limitations of space and time. It's liberated. So I am aspiring for that. But I still remain partly as a biographical thing, as a human being, I am still trapped. But I now know the real me is not trapped. The truth within me, the light of that gives me life is not trapped, is not conditioned. I am conditioned mentally, culturally, religiously, and so on. So that is the ultimate, the nearest you can get to full liberation. The full liberation comes after leaving the body and the mind. But that preliminary awakening gives me, if you like, an understanding that death is a great celebration. It doesn't matter, welcome, whenever it comes. And without desiring it, because I'm accessing again the touch of that part in me that is liberated. Yeah, there's a saying in Sanskrit in Vedanta, which is uh, lesha vidya, and what it means is faint remains of ignorance. And they say that 
you need a little bit of ignorance in order to just function in the world. So in that respect, you're trapped. Uh, but it's a, just a faint remain. So predominantly, you're not trapped. Uh, but then, you know, the little bit you are. So, I mean, you know, Shankara had health problems and Ramana Maharshi had cancer and, you know, all these people, everyone dies of something. So the body definitely has its limitations. But they all spoke of an inner freedom, which was untouched by those physical problems. Absolutely. I mean, just the look of Ramana's face, that reconciliation of what it was, as though I could occasionally hear a voice saying that, what's wrong with all of the others don't realize all of this, but they want me to talk. What is there to talk? It's already, <laughs> it's around us if we are sensitive enough to see it. <laughs> That's it. Um, what are some of your books about? I know Son of Karbala is a uh, autobiography and uh, subtitled The Spiritual Journey of an Iraqi Muslim. Um, Sufi encounters. I mean, you could just say a sentence or two about each of these books so people could know whether they might want to read them. Sufi encounters, sharing the wisdom of enlightened Sufis. What is that, like stories of different Sufis? That was really a, a, a collection, an, an anthology of interesting situations I've learned from and I enjoyed and I was in. It's probably 30, 40, 50 connections that I've had. And so each one of them was made into just a small little vignette. It was that. It was, if you like my journey, I was very fortunate in being able as a young man to travel around the world and, and on and on later on. So Sufi Encounter was my little meetings with different people who had influenced me. So, and I learned something, I benefited from all of those. They're, they are real. I mean, that is really much more my Sufi biography or my spiritual biography. As for Son of Karbala, it was much more of a commentary connecting the personal individual with the social and the political to show how hypocritic we are as human beings. We're supposed to be religious, spiritual, accountable, this and that. And look at all the hypocrisy that's happening in Karbala and which ended up actually in the destruction of it all by heavy handed, you know, criminal politicians and so on. But really, these were all expressions of my own movements and having had the time and the energy and the means of producing them, that there's really expressing my gratitude, actually. So most of, most of these books were that. Expressing gratitude, if anybody enjoys them, good. If not, it was, there, were, there was no attempt whatsoever to create a, an ambience of a special community or a special, you know, gathering or a grouping or none of that. I somehow knew from a very young age that the, the, the time for individual uh, closely knit people together in a place will not work anymore. The universality had taken over. Otherwise, it will end up being a bit like an Amish type of an attempt. Or, and as I said earlier, it will have a, touches of cults. It won't work. And whatever religion you are born in is an accident of your birth. But wake up to the real you, which is beyond you and beyond all. And that's where we unify. Essentially, in that, from that perspective, we're all the same. Therefore, you respect everyone. They're all spirits caught in a while in the mind and in the body and in the culture and in the color of the skin. So that really had been, once I knew that, then what am I trying to do? Create what community? We're all the same. The whole world is the same. But you did create a community down in supporting. Messina, Texas, which sounded like it was quite successful. No, not, not really. successful? I, I, it was, well, I don't. For me as a person, yes. Because I did it and I ran out of it. So I got out of it. <laughs> Not really, no. Too late. 200 years too late. I think. Or 300 years. No, but I had to do it. I had to, in a way, an act of service. And I had the means and the energy and youthfulness. No, I think I could now say it was e even very honest foolishness. But that's fine. But it was honest. <laughs> I didn't know any better. That's fine. And I had the means and the energy fine. 
And I ended up harboring a lot of ex-Vietnam soldiers, others poor people, messed up with, out of place, out of context, no. Anyway, it was, it was one of those things that there was honesty in it and quite a bit of lack of wisdom in a higher sense. <laughs> Seems like Texas not, might not have been the most uh, supportive place to try such a thing. <laughs> kind of a... Nowhere in the world at that time it was yeah, really yeah. too late. A few hundred years ago, maybe, but no, it's too late. Now, here is a young person with aspiration, having suddenly glimpsed something, uh, experienced something, wants to share it, wants to care. It's, you know, there are limitations, you can't. You know. And at the same time, incidentally, Rajneesh was a few hundred kilometers oh, up Oregon, north. Yeah. Yeah. Another, yeah. So, you know, it, time has passed. Now you have to truly individually wake up through silence, through turning off your human side to catch a glimpse of the great gift in you, the ultimate treasure without measure, your own soul. That's how I see it. A couple more books I'll ask you about here. Spectrum of, Spectrum of Reality, Sufi Insights. That's again, just little vignettes or... This has in it the whole story. I think about three, four hundred insights, yes. They are a bit like the pattern of how things are. That is a textbook of how things are. It is this, but not quite a bit of that. That is a very useful book. If I am to have anybody serious who want to see at the overlaying of multitudes of patterns that governs existence and human being, I think that's as good as any. So maybe people should start with that one. Yeah, Definitely. Okay. I think if you start with that, you'll end up rejecting the shadows of the so-called you and without denying it fully, but having it less afflicting you, I think. I think yeah, that's the I'll best. read more of that one myself. Um, the Garden of Meaning. This is a commentary on that, is that every meaning, every form has an innate inner if you like, origin, pattern. It is the seen and the unseen connecting. It is the micro and the macro, the balance of that. It's an enjoyable book, you know. For you, it will be one hour oh, reading. it's a short one. You just read it <laughs> yeah. in an evening. You will enjoy it. <laughs> you will enjoy it. <laughs> and then Witnessing Perfection, a Sufi guide. It's a bit dense. It, it, I dip in into my the other side of the higher. And so it, it is, again, you will enjoy that. Witnessing perfection is uh, to transcend anything within duality. Anything I perceive as imperfect, the pain that my finger had by being caught in the door is in its appearance imperfect, but it conceals perfection. It is the balance that Whatever I conceive has in it an outer state, not appropriate, not good for me, I am hurt, and an inner higher meaning which prevails in a sense. These were all expressions of my own phase and states that I've been in. But these three books you mentioned are the best. Which, which three are the best? So Witnessing Perfection, the, Garden of Meaning, and Spectrum right. of Reality. Spectrum of, is the is the is a dictionary. Yeah, that's it. okay. Good. Um, so you have a YouTube channel and you have about three websites. Um, so what um, in what ways can people connect with you or interact with you or learn from you? Do you give online courses? If we if we weren't in a pandemic, would there be something they could come to South Africa to do or or what? So what if people are listening to this? What how can they plug in to what you're doing if they want to? I have a feeling that through the YouTubes and the few books, like four or five that we already covered, there is enough material for anyone to take from it what is suitable for them. And then practice, as you do, to transcendence, practice silence, practice. With that background, I think the practices will make the journey quicker from the seen and the visible and duality into its origin and the energizing source 
which is the eternal unity. I think it's already there. And through YouTube and so on, I, almost every week or two, there are a few people very serious. They communicate. And if it comes to me, I do answer it. I have the time, I have the energy, but I don't have an institutionalized, if you like, organization as such. As I said earlier, I'm avoid, I've avoided, thankfully, successfully, creating a community and an ashram. I think nowadays every home needs its own inner ashram, every human being. And we connect, communicate, and, and through the internet. Here, I mean, you and I, I mean, I have here met somebody I trust completely in their authenticity, in their honesty. So these are big gifts nowadays. So there's more and more, if you like, in the cloud. Yeah. So, so that is a big gift, really, rather than the physical travel and the difficulties. I had for about 15 years a center in Pretoria. Very well done, beautifully built, several friends and supporters locally. They did a magnificent job. By the time we ended up having a magnificent library, there's nobody to come to the library. <laughs> There's right. a lockdown. <laughs> so when the lockdown's over, though, maybe people could come there. Or... I don't know, but everything is available. Online, everything yeah. has been right. digitized. You know, so really, it's life has yeah. changed, and I'm delighted with that also. And I somehow feel believe in providence. If you are up to it, if it is ready, it will come through. It will open up. You know, today we have a bit of a glitch here about our power. You know, we're in the end of, in the, in the, it, really, right in the tropics of South Africa. And I thought, well, if it is to happen, I think visible goodness and joy will come. If it is not to happen, I celebrate the master of it all. So we have to do what we can and trust in the yeah. cloud. <laughs> trust the cloud. <laughs> trust the cloud. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a story uh, I, I, that kind of uh, reflects on your aversion to institutionalizing things. There's the story where God and the devil were walking down the road together and God reaches down, picks something up and puts it in his pocket. And the devil said, hey, what's that? And the God, God said, oh, it's just the truth. And the devil said, oh, give it to me. I'll organize it for you. <laughs> but we also like order. So organizing is a natural state of the macro situation of the micro desire for order. It's unavoidable. It happens anyway. You know, it's so like somebody's against organized religion, they become another organized religion. See that? <laughs> really, it happens like that. <laughs> I think that, you know, we've talked a lot about liberation and, uh, and boundaries or, or being con confined or restricted. I think that, again, I mean, this is, we kind of started this whole conversation on this topic, but um, I think that the name of the game, the, the, tr the trick, is to integrate or coordinate, and to integrate is the best word, boundaries and boundless. Um, you need orderliness and structure and routine in order to function efficiently, but those can be very restricting. They can kill the genius in you, you know, but if you can incorporate or the unbounded, the transcendent within those boundaries, then you have the best of both worlds. You have the freedom and you also have the, the efficiency of organization. And those two zones are seamlessly connected. <laughs> the infinite unseen and the finite limited seen and structured, they're infinitely connected. One of them is the earthly side in us, the human side of us, and the other side is the heavenly side of us and the sacred eternal light in us. They're ever together. We have to reconcile that, experience it, see it, and then apply the zone. So this is a very practical matter. You're talking to me about a, a roof that has fallen. You know, we have to get somebody who knows more about that mm -hmm. side. And if you're talking about, you know, spiritual ego and somebody's gone out of his head, you know, as, as many people do, I said, so people don't revere me enough as a God, you know. So, you know, that's something else. Run away. If anybody tells you, I again, Buddha, if anybody says, I'm a Buddha, kill him. It's a lie. Don't do that. You know, run away from that. It's nonsense. You know, the essence pervades all. But the physical, material, chemical is something else. You know, perspective. There are two zones in us. 
one zone in me is limited human being, fearful, anxious, etc. Doesn't want to cause havoc. Correct. This is a decent human being. But the other side of me is beyond the beyond. Everything has its own, if you like, domain. And the two meet. They do not mix up. They, one of them does not overwhelm the other. Otherwise, it is religious fascism. Everybody has to be the same. Everybody, no. People are diff- Some people will go through lifetime, very simple, and they're quite whatever it is. Others like to be in ritual. For, others want organized. Different, different, different. But the quest is the same. The quest is to touch by will, by grace, a zone of infinitude that gives you more than hope, reassures you that destiny is perfect. That's Very good. There is a perfect perfection. Yeah. In and of course, that infinitude is, what's that saying? I think it's from the Quran, isn't it? Or from that God is closer than your own jugular vein? Correct. It's yeah. in the Quran. I am closer to you than your jugular vein. There are a dozen such little verses in the Quran. He is with you wherever you are. He was already there before you, after you. It's that there is only God, that it means. There is only that reality. It isn't you and God. The so-called you is only a shadow. Also in, in, in many, many aspects of other religions have similar things, such as you know, man is the shadow of God on earth and all of that. That's because there is within every human being that eternal light, that sacred light. If I don't interfere too much, if I put my shadow away, then the light will guide me, will lead me, will never mislead me. I will never be disappointed. I will never be. I do what I can and trust in the rest. Yeah, that's great. I don't think we can overemphasize this enough. Um, you know, all the eight billion people in the world, no matter how poor or uneducated or wealthy or well-educated or whatever tradition or non-tradition, whether they're atheists, anything else, uh, you know, we all have that light within. And, you know, so it's kind of like we're all, we've all won the lottery and uh, most people don't realize that they've left the lottery ticket, the winning lottery ticket in their sock drawer and they're walking around begging on the street. You know? <laughs> um, but, and imagine if, if everyone were to sort of claim that prize, that prize of, of God that, is so is closer than their jugular vein. How how that would transform the world? <clears throat> you can't claim it. It yeah, claims yeah. you. Once you claim it, then you have brought spiritual materialism and all of the other dreadfulness that happens. You have to lose all. There are two zones in you. One is the earthly zone. The more I have, the more I have. I can demonstrate it. But the spiritual side of me, spiritual health of me. The less I have, the more it is. So the courtesy to each zone is very different. The outer is outer, measurable. Where is your money? Where is the building? Where is your wealth? Not there. You've been lying. But the spiritual side of me, I know what secrets I harbor in terms of, you know, desires, hope. What I know. So who am I lying to? If I am truly, utterly, in submission to the moment, then it is wonder upon wonder upon wonder upon wonder. But when it comes to the worldly side, I'm expecting to provide a meal or a place or a house, then it's something else. Now I'm accountable in that zone. That's why our human justice has to be only on the outer. What did you do? You, obviously, you look, you, he lost his leg. You, know, you caused an accident. You know, accountable. So you can't, there's a beautiful, amazing, description of the uh, end of uh, physical, historical Jesus. Quran says he he was never killed. They imagined him. One of the meanings of imagined him is that they took him as this body. He was a light. He's a divine light. It's not a body. (laughs) So, So we have there are two sides in each one of us. The outer is a visible, measurable, discernible. The inner is a state. And you can't flaunt that because it's, it's between you and the creator of it, between you and the grace that is upon you. And 
As long as you are alive, there is always a touch of the animal. We can't deny that. So it becomes less and less and less. And sorrows, miseries, afflictions, fears do not affect one deeply. They just touch you and move. So yes, this is not. It's a loss because the soul is so rich beyond any measure of richness. So there is no loss. But the so-called me, I do experience loss, gain, good and bad. But the less there is of that, the more there is of the master within, my own soul, the divine presence. Good. Well, that might be a good note to end on. It's very profound. I don't think we can, I certainly can't improve upon it. Uh, is there any other final thoughts you wish to express or? or yeah. Yes, I, I want to express gratitude. To oh, yes, that. likewise. It's, it's an honor. Really, it's true. <laughs> it is really, we have to express gratitude. It's not, not ordinary, not someone like you, the work you're doing, what you're trying to spread, make available is most commendable, really. Truly, truly, truly. Well, as you know, from your own experience... May it be super efficient. May it be such that, that it will just flow and flow and flow and flow. Yeah, it's, it's a joy. And, you know, as you know from your experience, it's, you're the prime beneficiary of, you know, it's, it's, it's touching people oh. and helping people, but it, it enriches you so much to That's... be an instrument for it. Of course. No, and it enriches you by getting rid of the so-called you it's a stripping out because the real you is beyond richness so that's it does but i'm really delighted for our guest. Oh, yes well thank you very much and i truly pray for it to reach wherever whatever in the right timing because these things again have to do with grace if it touches in the right time that's it there's a big step in that awakening to the high treasure then we stop chasing after all of the other things. Not important. Good. Well, as they said in Star Trek, live long and prosper. And uh, prosper especially, I mean, in this in spiritual sense, which you are doing. And thank you so much for everything you've been doing. You've you've you know led such an exemplary life, and you know, really bridging the practical world and the spiritual world and uh, integrating them and, and sharing the the inner treasures that you've found with, with so many people. It's just really the way life should be lived, in my opinion. I am most, most grateful for what I've been put through. Again, it is the grace of God, and there is only the grace of God with shadows that we also fall into their traps. I am delighted, delighted, delighted. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As I say, the you, I take it to as universal on origin and cosmic essence. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you, Sheikh Fadla. Uh, so, and thanks to those who have been listening or watching. Um, as you know, as we said in the beginning, this is an ongoing series. There have been nearly 600 of these conversations now. And if you go to batgap.com, um, you can find all the previous ones organized, and you'll explore the menus. You'll see a bunch of other things that you might be interested in. Um, so thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Thanks again, sir. Blessings. Thank you. I am great. Thank you. <laughs>